platforms dealing in and around the emerging technologies. Further, I have been joined by my colleague Arvin and Naveen, who will also assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving technical glitches if it comes in between. So thanks a lot to, to putting in such a hard work and making this one a huge success. We'll try to provide a seamless experience to all of you so that you can main, gain maximum output out of the same. Let me provide a brief background to all of you about AI Core Spot. We started a couple of years back, backed up by InfoVision, who is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, who is our technology partner. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies. The focus is to provide all of you a deep dive in all the sectors, wherever technology is there. And every month, our theme is different. We are gaining momentum month on month. Our aim is to be number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you can be a part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a success. The focus is to do industry-backed webinars and hybrid events. The knowledge base will be made from reliable data through industry leaders, subject matter experts, thought leaders, and our partners. We'll enrich the content through different channels like newsletters, podcasts, videos, blogs, digital content, and so on to shed light on the ever-evolving ever industry. Today, we are having a lovely and unique webinar around the great theme, which lays emphasis on breaking the myths about hyper-automation and the key to unlocking data and scaling innovation. So if you guys want to know the difference between automation and hyper-automation, emotions, feelings, myths, how to get the hyper-automation done, and much more, then you are in the right place. We'll go all over it throughout the panel discussion and give lots of insights to you. There are lots more in store for next month with focus on different technologies like AI, ML, blockchain, IoT, AR, VR, digital twins, metaverse, quantum computing, and so on. So request all of you to go through our website, which is aicoresport.io for future updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything, what we propose to offer in the coming month. Before starting with the day, I would like to highlight a few things so that it can set up the tone for the amazing learning and networking day. Special mention about our knowledge and innovation partner, InfoVision, who has supported us since beginning and provided us the right support to bring the community together. So some brief about InfoVision. It's an end-to-end -end IT and business services provider specializing in providing technology transformation and innovation projects for over 25 years across multiple industries they serve 12 global locations, including US, Latin America, Middle East, and India. They also have a unique state-of-the-art research and innovation lab named Digit7 with five great innovative products in a couple of locations. One is at US in Richardson, Texas, and in India, it's at Coimbatore. So to get in touch with them, kindly log on to the website, which is infovision.com, and leave your details through the contact us section. Now, moving on. Community partners for today. It includes Consumer Finance Limited, American Express, and Unity Small Finance Bank Limited, who came together to make this webinar a success. Special mention to attendees of the event who registered and came together to achieve their objectives through this forum. At the end of the day, if you gain a few things out of this or get to network with each other, our core objective as a platform will be achieved. Further, if anybody wants to ask questions, they can type it in the QA section. You can type in as and when the panel member speaks, and we'll try to get it answered as per the time permitted. Now, let me hand over the stage to Rajendra, who is the Chief Business Officer, Asia, Middle East, India, at InfoVision, and who is the moderator for this panel discussion as well. He's joined by four great leaders, Deepak, Srikant, Mamta, and Vaidyanathan. And I'm sure they will introduce themselves and do the honors. So over to you, Rajendra, to begin this exciting panel discussion. Thank you very much, Nitin. A very good morning to everyone, a good day to everyone. Uh, it's absolutely pleasure to be hosting this uh, and moderating this event. Uh, they say either uh, you are the part of the automation or you get automated. And that's what's said by Tom Preston one. And we are taking the same theme. Uh, we definitely would like to actually take on the overall myths of hyper automation and, and see what best is the way that we can deal with them. But a quick fire introduction from everyone. Uh, I would like to start with Deepak, who happens to be the founder and the chief strategy officer for Evolio IT. Uh, Deepak. 
Thank you. Pleasure to be on this forum today and uh, good morning to everyone uh, or good day from wherever you're joining. Uh, my name is Deepak, one of the co-founders of Evolute IQ, like Rajendra said. I run the strategy and operations for the company. Uh, we are an end-to-end hyper automation enablement platform working with clients across uh, the globe. Uh, and uh, you know, prior to this, I have uh, 22 years of experience in the consulting space. Uh, so bring a lot of that uh, you know, when we're actually doing implementations for enterprise customers globally. Thank you, Deepak. We are definitely going to look forward to hear some real technology insights from you. Uh, moving on to Mamta, who happens to be heading a pretty large portfolio of AI, ML, and the upcoming technologies across the American Express faction. So, Mamta. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rajendra. Okay, so for me, I am, like uh, Rajendra mentioned, I'm heading the enterprise-wide AI platforms and products at American Express, which is where we have our own platform where anyone and everyone in the organization, if they want to do uh, anything to do with machine learning, whether it is for them to learn, develop their models, uh, go on their model, deploy, monitor, or do anything, uh, you know, with respect to the, the machine learning model that gets done on my platform. Uh, we are, of course, you know, both uh, on-prem as well as hybrid. But prior to uh, American Express, which I joined last year, I was uh, working with Accenture and a few more organizations prior to that. In total, I bring in about uh, 17 years of experience. I was uh, heading the retail analytics practice for Accenture uh, uh, prior to coming to MX. In my personal life, I am married uh, for last uh, 17 years again uh, with a you know, with a son who goes to uh, six, uh, class 10 right now. His board exams are going on. And I love to uh, spend my free time doing a yoga practice and playing Sudoku with my mom-in-law. Thank you, Mamta. We are really uh, going to look forward to get the actual practical aspects uh, for both from consulting side as well as from the banking perspective. Uh, moving on to Srikanth. Uh, Srikanth uh, happens to be heading the uh, VP technology faction for uh, Bajaj uh, uh, Auto Finance uh, division. So, Srikanth. Oh, very, very good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, looking forward for this excited webinar. And uh, all thanks to the sponsors and also to the presenters to for making a very good topic, which is very useful in all aspects of our technology transformations and initiatives. So um, myself, Srikanth, and I uh, head uh, technology as CTO for Bajaj, Bajaj Auto Consumer Finance. It's a uh, captive uh, NBFC, or we can call it a captive subsidiary for Bajaj Auto. So the main objective is to uh, promote Bajaj Auto, uh, two-wheelers, three-wheelers, pro-biking, and um, different other products as well to for both domestic and international uh, market. So a um, lot of efforts are going into um, uh, setting up new age of fintech process for, for Bajaj Auto. And uh, it's been like uh, a very newly joined here, been like four or five months and a lot of work uh, been happening on setting up this pretty large massive unit for both domestic and international. And before this, I was with Indescent Bank, um, you know, where I was heading uh, subsidies of uh, Indescent Bank, uh, especially Bharat uh, Finance. Uh, Bharat Finance, before it was called as Case Microfinance. So my entire experience uh, has been uh, two decades of experience in mainly in fintech, uh, finance being my uh, domain, and uh, been part of many large uh, transformations in the industry, uh, especially in the finance uh, space at NBFC. And before that, I spent most of my time uh, in US. I was ex-Microsoft, IBM, G, and all that, doing a lot of product engineering and a lot of product innovations in that uh, space. So, so this is all the background uh, of mine and looking forward uh, to sharing my insights on this topic. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you, Shrikant. I think it's a very uh, good combination, both in terms of fintech as well as the retail from the finance perspective of Bajaj. We are really looking forward to hear your uh, thoughts and expertise. Uh, moving on to very interesting participant, last but not the least, Vedanathan. He is the CIO at Unity Bank. Uh, very recently, they have completed an extremely interesting project. And uh, whether you want to talk about your background and experience. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thanks for giving me an opportunity, especially to AI Core Spot. And my AI and all this journey, interestingly, starts now. And while I've been doing a lot of stuff as a consultant, Overall, I have been in the industry for close to 35 plus years in the banking and finance industry, 
with a 360 degree view as a customer as a user as a consultant as a vendor who sold hardware software and uh, everything that is you know i am with unity now been with them for close to a year unity small finance bank is uh, one plus years old and uh, trying to compete with the best of the best so the only way to do that is to do something different something more unique something more uh, eye catchy in the market and uh, to beat the best at their own game so that where technology comes into play and uh, technology is no more a back office function now i mean uh, we get the best seat in the boardroom now and everybody listens to us when you talk so ai definitely we are as far as unity is concerned we are still uh, looking at that in, in the starting mode but uh, as far as ai is concerned you know uh, there are a lot of things that are uh, as a consultant have done so would be happy to share some of them as we move along in this but happy to be here and would be a uh, learning for me as well when i listen to the other uh, speakers in the forum thank you very i think uh, the very interesting aspect you know the uniqueness and the different aspects that you are going to bring i think they are going to uh boost the morale for the automation aspect so we'll straight away get into the topic uh but first of all before going into this uh, one question starting with deepak deepak can you tell us uh, is hyper automation just a new word or a jargon i mean there has been automation few people have done it few people have a different view altogether or oh, is it just a marketing mimic i mean what what exactly is it maybe if you can share with us the automation and hyper automation how exactly a technology person will look into it and then we'll move to mamta to find out how business person looks into it so deepak starting with you absolutely so it's not right i think the short answer is it's not a, it's not a buzzword it's not a myth of course the you know the terminology changes as we as we progress right uh, and you know some analysts call it hyper automation some others call it intelligent automation but you know the whole focus is actually moving away from the traditional way of looking at automation to really looking at a more integrated way and end to end way right so so it's really about that right and again you know terms like you said can you know can can evolve uh, but if you look at so traditional automation versus you know the the new way of doing things or hyper automation what we saw earlier was automation was focused really on solving parts of the problem right and, and not addressing the full end to end problem itself so therefore the approach that was followed was more disjointed you know for example if you look at rpa which you know has seen a lot of traction over the last you know 3 or 4 years it was really solving what is called as task automation right so looking at repetitive aspects of the business process and automating that right if you look at workflow earlier it was really focused on you know integrating or providing the interaction between systems and systems and systems and humans but for example it was not able to handle large volumes of data that is becoming so important in our business processes today right similarly they couldn't handle ai ml you know to actually embed that intelligence in the overall customer and user journey right so that's that was essentially the the old way of doing things of course you also had things like you know integration tools or ipas as it's called right you and then for the front end for example to build any you know business application or looking looking at things like you know bringing a human in the loop as it's called but looking at exceptions for example you need to build a front end you, you know organizations today for example look at a very custom way of developing that right now what all this creates right in the traditional way of doing things is you end up combining five six different technologies together that takes a lot of time to implement it takes a lot of effort and of course cost but also more importantly it's reducing the agility of the business to deal with you know the changes that are happening around it right and we all saw that what happened in the pandemic was that you know the 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 need to have digital first solutions was hugely accelerated right and therefore if you did not have that integrated approach which hyper automation enables you know organizations were falling behind right so that's in in a nutshell right the difference and and the evolution so hyper automation addresses all of these it brings together capabilities of you know process data rpa even processing machine learning connectivity with your you know systems of engagement and systems of record in a single integrated front end and in a low code environment in most cases uh, to enable the businesses to actually you know innovate fast and take out digital first solutions quickly hey, thanks deepak i think it makes a huge sense to have the complete combination and collocation of all the aspects so moving on to uh, mamta uh, you deal with i mean in american express and the, all the other banks uh, you deal with so much of data so is it uh, can we say for banks and for for the finance aspects the only automation is hyper automation what's 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 your take about 
I uh, I mean, I would pretty much agree with what you're saying, uh, Rajendra. The only automation nowadays, if I were to use the term hyper automation, it is that. But let me take you back, you know, 20 to 25 years back, which is where, and, and if you think about uh, American Express, I mean, we are the only organization which is not only a, you know, credit card uh, providers, but we are also, you know, our own payment network owners. So the kind of data that comes to us becomes even more complicated, even more, you know, uh, huge in terms of the volumes that we deal with and that's the reason way back you know about 25 to 30 years back is when you know american express realized that how important it is for us to bring in efficiencies as much as possible we obviously were not calling it hyper automation at that point of time things were getting done in bits and pieces but the philosophy that we follow at american express is anything which gets done more than twice should be automated, plain simple, right? It, it should not get done manually anymore. If you feel that it is already done twice and there are more opportunities for it to be repeated, you should just get it automated. That's the philosophy that we always carry on with. Way back in 2010, we started exploring machine learning and that's where I think most of the financial institutions, I'm not bragging, but most of the financial institutions were still trying to figure out how BI could be uh, you know, utilized. But then American Express were already, you know, experimenting with machine learning. Right now, we have our own AIML platform um, and products, which, you know, you, you can compare it with the likes of GCP, uh, you know, uh, within GCP, the, you know, the the um, analytical environment that they have or AWS SageMaker or Azure, uh, you know, analytic interface that they have and things like that. So that's, you know, the, the crux of... Uh, anything in it and everything that you need to do we need to make it you know bring it to the you know forefront of the business and that's what brings in you know the 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 amount of efficiencies we can unlock right uh, i mean if, if i were to say the difference between automation and hyper automation is last five to seven years we've started looking at doing things end to end and also specifically because there is a lot of audit and compliance happening from organizations like OCC, which, you know, really has a you know, lot of keen eyes on banks to really say that things which are done are done in, in the well-governed way or not. Hence, hyper-automation becomes very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Mamta. Thank you so much. I think it's it's very clear, both from technology perspective as well as from the business perspective. So it's moving straight away into the myths. Uh, so Vedanathan, from your perspective, both as a, a you know, technology evangelist, as a bank, uh, uh, and, and the vast experience you have in business, what's the interesting myth or a completely uh, unique myth that you have heard about uh, hyper-automation, uh, Vedanathan? See, if you were to answer that, you know, people generally think, you know, uh, anything if you want to do something new, they say it's not doable or it's la like landing man on Mars. That's the first sentence when you try to do something out of the ordinary. Personally, for the automation perspective or a hyper automation, it starts with me. I'm a tech geek. So anything that comes into the market new, a new iPhone, a new watch, a new uh, pencil, a new tab. You know, I connect them all. And uh, since I fly a lot, then uh, this question of what if the plane crashes? So, uh, I know, will the office work? Will my family run? So then I called it the blue book. Then how do I automate everything so that people, my, my family still lives and they know what is my password to everything? So I have literally automated everything onto my pad and the password is the same across my laptops and my house and my pad. So that's, that's one of the simple examples of my personal life where everything, the, the second thing, very, very fun, Anything like hyper automation, my my very dear, very uh, say pet German Shepherd ran away uh, a couple of weeks back, and we are running around to find him for three hours. We were helter skelter, almost my daughter was in tears. Then I realized that that fellow doesn't have a tag or a GPS, and then he realized there is a need. So that dog has to be hyper automated now. He has to be traced. Now the second thing is now uh, I. I love driving. So if you look at uh, cars, so when you move from a normal car to a highly automated car, you know, in, in my BMW, if I open the right side door, driver side door, the engine shuts off. It's a safety feature. Whereas you open any other door, you know, the car still is running. 
and I, I got the feeling that you know there's something wrong with that uh, car. So I switched it on and off. Then I said, please close the door, restart the engine. This is, again, it's a hyper automation. Look at you know our dependency on Google to do anything and everything for a map. Sometimes Google literally takes you for a ride and doesn't know the right route. There may be shortest route, but again, hyper automation. You know. So if I were to talk from a banking perspective, this automation. Now, if I started this my journey sometime in '84 with a Japanese bank and my core banking journey started there. And uh, those were the eras when the nationalized bank and public sector banks and working something called the TBA, total branch automation. They called it total branch mechanization. And uh, I mean, it, it was interpreted the way the advisor, the directors in various banks love to call it. So, um, and from that to where today, we are doing banking on WhatsApp, internet, mobile, and then so in 97, when I first lectured about technology, I uh, came with an article called TLRB, Total Leadership in Retail Banking and AAA Banking, Anytime, Anywhere, Anyhow Banking. So in 97, when I presented, people said, oh God, I mean, you are a foreign banker, you don't understand public sector, you're trying to land a man on Mars. Uh, so they didn't say moon because there was already a man on there, they've got the footprint there. So, uh, but today, if you see that is done and dusted, everybody has core banking implemented. So, and you know, that myth is busted. So, every time you try to do something new, there is a new myth, and people think it's not possible. If somebody takes the initial steps and oh, it's so easy, we can do it. So, there's a lot of see, see if you talk about banking, say AI, ML, RPA, and other digital tools to automate the and streamline the business process in bank. We're looking at something where you know. There are two things that happened in the Indian context was this goof up of this demonetization and then the COVID. This created the payment system. The first uh, demonetization created the payment system that automated end to end. So no change, no uh, coins, nothing. And you pay through the uh, you know, payment systems that you have on your phone. And you know, then you know, it, it happened that you can do a, a schooling or a college without going to college when the COVID happened. So literally my kids have finished off the, almost the graduation high school by sitting at home. So a mechanical engineer without seeing a lathe machine. So I mean, that's the kind of automation that has happened, but that's the outcome of uh, that. So today, when if we were to talk about my bank, we are a year old, we are a late entrant. We started sometime in November 2021, a year plus. And while we have some technology, I'm into a state of cleaning up. But being a late entrant, I have the advantage of moving and getting the latest, latest. So that, that's my only way of beating the best at their own game. So I've achieved one, which I'll talk later during this uh, discussion. So similarly, you know, what, what is it that makes us different from us? Technology is a very good shortcut to success there. I and mean, you get it right end to end, then and it gives you a lot of visibility. So, I mean, there are myths, but those myths get broken as and when somebody else does it. Hey, thank you, Vedan. I think that this is one, you know, it's difficult. Uh, and um, uh, moving on from bank to uh, the manufacturing and the automotive side, uh, Shrikant, uh, what do you think, which myth uh, you think you have heard and uh, what's what's the interesting one from your perspective, Shrikant? So, um, Rajendra, the, my definition for hyper-automation is, I'll put in this way, it's, it starts all from problem discovery. That could be a process discovery or a problem discovery. And further, I can categorize the main difference between automation and hyper automation is, you know, the automation could be the, it's kind of, as I said, the problem discovery. And hyper automation could be an intelligent problem discovery. You know, there's a very thin line of difference between this uh, automations and hyper automation. So, so to take you the perspective of uh, in our domain, in our sector, what's been happening. So, so as I said, uh, we are a captive uh, unit uh, at FinTech. Of Bajaj. While there are a lot of automations programs happen in Bajaj uh, manufacturing, that could be uh, simulations, uh, uh, operative analytics, and uh, could be visual uh, analytics, a lot of automations, you know, chat uh, integrations, you know, uh, manufacturing different uh, discoveries, a lot of automations usually happens in the manufacturing and the also is trying to invest as much as they can to take this to the next level. 
but mainly my bajaj auto consumer finance is what we are trying to do is uh, to uh, put a automation process uh, very intelligently right from manufacturing of a product till to the financing the customer so how do we do this entire integration you know from the choice of the customer right from um, examples could be a customer walks into a dealership and want to take a vehicle and want to go for a loan so how do we get uh, the complete inventory track right from the manufacturing till to the choice of the customer you know that could be uh, right from selection of product spec and also financing uh, options for, for the customer so this entire collaboration of this workflow is something that uh, we are uh, trying to build so when we do this um, you know my my general advice or my general uh, you know observation is when we do this it's all about taking this particular problem identify i'm saying the problem discovery and then apply with a perfect analytics and insights what exactly we are trying to do and you know adding a layer of uh, insights on that you know converting that into a kind of a metric form will help the business and it to take a decision whether are we really doing automation or not you know and this automation need not be always to be associated with the technology it could be at the people the process or technology you know combining all this could be a, a delivery of automation or hyper automation and and the, the traditional benchmarking is something that you know usually when you have a manual process uh, happening you convert that into a traditional automation the metric is 2x to 3x you know so that is where you come to an automation journey from automation to hyper automation the benchmark should be like 5x only when your analytics speaks that you know yes you can further automate uh, with some 5x returns that could be in roi or uh, valuation process or efficiency productivity could be anything unless you have that metric doesn't really uh, make sense to put an effort to take this to the next level so analytics has to speak what exactly uh, we are trying to do where exactly we are standing as of now so this combinations of all this the a, a user or a customer or, or an it transformer or could be a business head all collectively can need to sit together have a matrix and take a decision so i'll just give you uh, one beautiful uh, uh, just a, a one minute business case you know what exactly uh, in my experience we transformed using hyper automation you know so this case study is like 5 year old but still it is very very relevant even now so so that will be very beneficial to all of us so 5 years back there was a a, a typical uh, you know a, a fintech company where i was been working and uh, we have a a traditional loan process you know where uh, a person goes to branch to branch uh, does uh, the loan process journey on a typical paper you know so that is a business case so now what we did was you know we automated that by giving uh, the loan officer with a tablet you know so this was like 5 6 years back you know so it was an era of slowly the mobility enterprise mobility all coming in yeah so we also took that journey uh, so we introduced a tablet and uh, where the loan officer takes the tablet and goes to different branches and furtherly into the villages and all that does the uh, traditional uh, banking on the tablet so we automated that you know by traditionally when it was happening like 25 days to get the data slowly we brought that to 10 days 10 days or you know uh, a week data so now what happened was so when the tablet has been introduced the automation happened but now this is where the whole uh, tricky thing happened so that was the time aadhars have started coming in sibils started coming in everything onto mobile platform so the mobile journey what we created suddenly turned into an hyper automation where the particular tablet has been associated so many peripheral devices you know the post machines the you know biometric machines all got connected to the tablet so now what happened it brought the 25 day data to one week now it's instant so this was an explosion of technology which helped the company to introduce you know more and more business products so this is a very classic case study even till today you know we have been the poster boy of this technology for nbfcs in microfinance industry even today uh, we this technology being used so this goes to the next scale now what need to be done so what i'm trying to say is metrics plays a very 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 important role to make and decision what 
investments required or what exactly we are trying to automate needs versus want so so this is a broad perspective of my uh, definition of uh, automation hyper automation yeah sure thank you thank thanks shikant so moving on to uh, so we have heard uh, from vedanathan about you know how difficult it is and and shikant just summarize the matrix based aspect uh, which definitely entails a very conscious decision um mamta from your perspective what myth have you heard uh, would you like to share with us so many so many of them that in that but i think one uh, the, the most uh, important one would be is it going to be very very expensive uh, another that i've heard is uh, you know if when um, i start on the automation journey will i have the right skills in my organizations will i be able to really do it myself or i'll have to buy and hence it becomes even more expensive but i feel that uh, you know uh, rajendra it's it's all about you know the mindset first of all when you're starting on your automation journey why it becomes expensive is because we go in bits and pieces we do something and then after some time we want to do something else which may need to a lot of rework which may need to lot of throw away work etc and that's where in my team as well whenever we are going ahead for to build a new product i always discuss with my team that what is the poa vision that we have for us right where is it that we want to arrive eventually let's look at that vision in total define what your strategy is going to be for that poa vision and then do it piecemeal which is okay because then you know what is your end objective and you are then you know just phasing it out sequencing it out based on how much of budget you have or based on how much of time you have what kind of skills you have etc not to say that you know every all the skills that you would require for hyper automation would be readily readily available in your organizations already i don't think so one of the most critical skills that is required which you may or may not have is data stewards because even today i don't see many organizations have one single unit which understands the organization's data end to end and that's where you know all of the organizations are sitting on tons and tons of data we keep saying data is the new oil but we don't know how to interpret that data into something which is really valuable so i mean i feel that only one you know uh, or two skills that a company needs to or an organization needs to invest is into is one the data stewards and second you know um, a little bit of uh, you know cloud skills etc but apart from that i think 80 to 90% of the skills are already available in your organization in terms of your you know citizen data scientists citizen data engineers your software engineers and all of those people so i guess you know of course there are a lot of myths there are also myths around you know with hyper automation will i lose my job with hyper automation uh, will i become redundant in the organization but you know of course there are reasons uh, you know why you should keep on learning and enhancing your skills why you should not stick to that manual way of doing things etc but yes you know these are few that i've heard thanks momta so i think so far we have we have recorded you know the difficulty that process which uh, uh, and then we we also talked about the overall way it's expensive to get the all the aspects together then we talked about the people skills you know the skills skills are not available or uh, you know it's it's going to be leading to job losses some these are some of the myths so deepak from your perspective uh, which is the one which you have heard and then we'll straight away get into solving these myths yeah so i think a couple and you know i agree with everything that's been said so far a couple that i think you know haven't been um, haven't been spoken about that you know we see in our our implementations is one you know there's a lot of emphasis on the productivity improvements and the cost reduction and of course that is important right but more often than not it's really it becomes only about that right so i think one of the key myths is you know how do we you know it's not only about that right how do we look at uh, you know the other aspects of hyper automation that are important right whether it is things like you know enabling customer experience and you know in today's sort of digital first world that's important so you know creating you know seamless customer user journey so that's important uh also then you know looking at uh, you know things like churn propensity analysis and i think what mamta mentioned around using data to power customer journeys you know that's that's critical uh also the other uh, you know myth if you may is around you know how do you how does this coexist in the ent- enterprise it and you know the 
the fact that this could for example create a shadow it so i think those are a couple of aspects we should explore further you know which often comes out come up as you know myths uh, as we do these implementations thanks deepak so uh, i have collected uh, all the top 5 myths you know one is difficult one is expensive one will lead to job losses and turmoil one needs special skills and um, and obviously uh, creating a separate entity and the renewal of the technologies it's difficult you know one one participant has posted a very interesting question uh, uh, it's by arshana and i thanks arshana for really getting involved in this and asking the question so she asks what are some of the biggest challenges or pitfalls that organizations may encounter when implementing hyper automation how do you overcome these challenges so uh, maybe uh, deepak you want to continue and just give us a we know we are going to discuss some of these challenges uh, whether it is the prerequisites whether it is the implementation aspects but at a high level i think quite a few of that is already discussed but you want to just recap uh, deepak quickly before we go on to the next question so i think a couple of things come to mind right one i think is the the the, the critical challenge is really finding uh, the right technology right and, and like you said i have i'm taking a technology lens to this i'm sure there are others as well but you know finding a platform that is you know non intrusive in nature and can work with the rest of the ecosystem right that i think is one of the key challenges that organizations must you know deal with upfront and finding the right technology partner right that like i said can not only you know protect their existing investments in things like erps and crms but also technologies around data around process etc that they've already invested in right so i think that becomes a, a key part of it the second uh, key challenge is really around the change management and that's you know often overlooked i think shrikant mentioned this right it's not just about the technology it's people process you know and and uh, the technology sort of you know working together and uh, you know what we are seeing is uh, and it also ties back to the whole point we had around you know is it expensive you know what happens to the existing roles do people get redundant i think dealing with that up front and really figuring out a you know right mechanism for the overall personas in the organizations to work together and create that as an implementation road map i think if you deal with both these aspects up front uh then you know then i think you know you you're off to a good journey thanks deepak there's one more question by shreya singh i'm sorry i missed this question earlier but uh, uh she says my question will be how can organizations measure the roi of their hyper automation initiatives and what metrics should they track so at a very high level maybe in a in a minute or so mamta you want to take a stab at it uh we know we have the critical success factors and the key performance indicators that we are going to talk about but at a very high level would you like to uh share your thoughts about roi with shreya and everyone for sure for sure so shreya i mean if if i were to talk about some of the key you know uh, things that i would measure if i were to go on the hyper automation journey is one how much time am i now going to carve out for my team to do really innovative work so that's one thing which i think gets unnoticed a lot right because at times we are so involved in our day to day work in a manual way that we forget that you know the the human brains are not meant to do you know the repetitive things we tend to get bored right and that's where even for kids if you would uh, you know imagine we create so many different games uh, for our toddlers etc so that you know we can control their restlessness and so is uh, there for us as adults you know we have our own a uh, innovative bent of mind and we want to give them the right uh, channel to channelize it and that's where i guess hyper automation really plays a big role second thing i think deepak you mentioned about uh, customer delight and you know customer uh, uh, how smooth can we make the customer experience happen so if we are using a lot of machine learning uh, and uh, you know a lot of ai uh, kind of uh, tools and techniques you are able to really you know give them more relevant uh, give give your customers more relevant uh, offers information you know target them at the right time and things like that which not only leads to customer delight but also leads to a lot of you know preventive attrition control and things like that as well that is another kpi that i always uh, you know look for and then the third and most important kpi is how am i able to retain my talent because you know the industry is moving very very fast right and that's the 
you know that's when your talent keeps feeling that if you are being in in your cocoon and you're not innovating enough you're not going and you know uh, exploring those latest and greatest technology they feel that they are lagging behind and that's when you know they start thinking about uh, looking for some other opportunities and things like that and that's where you lose all the knowledge thought capital that you build over time among your people so how much are you able to retain your talent by investing into latest and greatest technology by making their life easy in terms of the mundane redundant task and providing them opportunities to do something really challenging really innovative Thank you, Mamta. I think it really summarizes very well. Uh, we have one more very interesting question, and I think it should go to Vedanathan. Uh, you know, Manish uh, asks, you know, chatbots used in banks, uh, success or failure, scare of losing the personal touch with customers has been highlighted in the US. And I think this, this also is one of the myths, you know, that uh, it's all about personal emotions, right? I mean, with the hyper automation, the robotics, are we losing the human or i don't want to say humane but that person touch so with another how how do you think uh, uh, how how would you like to see to this and would like to respond to manish's question with another just to answer this and all of us are customers of the bank all the people who are probably listening and who are also talking are a customer of the bank i think none of us want to get into a phone where it is an automated answer and you have to press numbers after numbers after numbers. You just want to pick up to a person, explain your unique problem, get an answer and thank you and say bye-bye. So probably where automation, I don't know whether we will reach a stage where which a robo will automatically answer that instead of a human being. It's still far from there. But some of the mundane tasks can be answered. But yes, if you put everything into these kind of automation where you pick up the number and you know you take 10 minutes you know and you say you are in queue please wait and some western music or pop music playing in the background i mean you go say so frustrated if the line drops then you are back to square one again dialing the same number i think and some of, I, I come across somebody who has in, uh, you know uh, devised a tool where been in a moment you dial in, then you dial just uh, switch on that uh, particular tool. It dial the sequence of the number two one nine four zero. It will take you direct to the operator. So this is another type of an automation to break this monotonous, you know, uh, telephone uh, uh, stupidity. I mean, that's what I feel. I even from a CIO's perspective, you know, uh, I might like to do it, but from a customer perspective, I don't want it. I would rather pick up the phone and directly go to the customer service agent, explain and sort it out. And, but So there, there is always a pros and cons to it. So it, it, it's not a one size fits all. But here, you know, there, there is a very interesting, um, uh, I think maybe 10 years back, this was a study done in where, you know, uh, you go to an ATM machine to withdraw money in London and all that. So some of these older generation people never liked it. They said for them, visiting a bank is a social activity. Because the machine don't talk to them, doesn't say hi to them, doesn't say doesn't smile at them, and you know you walk into a branch, you know the, the branch uh, clerk will say hello, Mrs. Johnson, how is you? How is your health now? What is your son doing? So I mean they find it, you know, somebody cares for me. I mean these people who live alone, they get bored. So that is not an end-to-end answer. I mean while we are still looking at a pro probably a digital banking unit completely unmanned. But that is not an answer or a panacea for all your problems. It's not a one size fits all. It's going to be a mix of both. And going forward, I think, for example, even the seniors, like you said, you know, 97, when I talked, not many had done it. But today, everybody has done. So what difference bank A, B, C, and B? So end of the day, the smile on the customer service officer's face. They, I mean, say before she even asked, yeah, you want to withdraw money, you want to deposit money. Uh, that probably a machine may not be able to preempt. So, I mean, yes, automation, yes, but it has to be very effectively used. Thank you, Vedanath. I think you've got a very important aspect, you know. We didn't realize that ATM was a classic example of automation, you know. Uh, instead of really giving a physical money by the teller, I think we didn't realize itself. We actually got automated, what, about three, four week, uh, decades ago, right? But yeah, I mean, moving on to thank you. Thanks. It's a very interesting perspective. ATM is now a dying breed. People <laughs> are moving away from ATM because nobody wants to have cash. It is all you know, UPI-based payments. Maybe five years down the line, you may not see an ATM machine. You may not see even currencies. 
So I mean, evolution. I mean, that that's part of evolution, I guess. True. We have one more question uh, by Subarish, you know, and uh, at a very high level, uh, he says, "What advice would you give to organizations that are just starting to explore the possibilities of hyper automation?" I think uh, Shrikant, you covered this uh, part, you know, when you said. You're going to collect together and you're going to create that matrix. So why don't you take a, a minute uh, into, uh, you know, giving some advice to the uh, new starters into the hyper automation, Shrikant? Uh, sure. So um, my advice could be um, to make it very simple, which is understandable to many starters, you know, from where uh, they need to start uh, these journeys. I would say uh, pick your framework, you know. Start with any framework that could be a Six Sigma or could be a traditional SDLCs or could be any innovation models or could be a TOGAF model or could be any framework, you know, which actually talks about identifying the business or IT problem. See, the, the whole lot of projects are actually categorized into either it's the business problem or IT problem, you know. So any decision what you're taking in terms of understanding what uh, where you stand and how to move forward select a, a traditional framework that will help you to understand uh, to give some kind of a metrics you know how do you automate then the technology selection the process selections the people selections can start so these days you don't need to be a big uh, wizard to understand this framework so everything is available on internet few formulas few techniques you just need to understand so that uh, it, it can be easily be achieved. A simple example could be to, uh, because the question is about for starters, you know, let's take a traditional corporate website, you know. So every organization has a corporate website. Now, what happens if corporate website gets hacked? You know? So usually, you know, you we put some scrapes. Uh, so even before automations, we have a corporate website and, you know, how do you get it hacked? It's very difficult to know unless you, someone goes and visits your uh, corporate website on a daily basis, you know. In fact, you know, we used to have monitoring team also, you know, 10, 15 years back, traditional to go and check what's happening on the website. Then we moved to the automation model that, you know, yes, uh, the scripts have come, the technologies have come, the malware, uh, you know, deception technology has come, threat teaming, threat hunting, you put all that into uh, your website. So anything anything happens, you will get a minimum alert saying that is something has some problem on your website. So to do this, you know, find out, you know, what are the technologies are available, which can slowly minimize the automation to get the basic alerts. Once you're done with that, then let's talk about the corporate website hyper automation. So when thing, anything happens on the corporate website, then an alert has to go to the relevant authorities. Also, it has to go and update your dark web also saying that there is some kind of, uh, you know, uh, ha hack happened on your corporate website. And it has to go to the dark web, raise the security incidents, talk to the governance, all through automations, I'm saying. Alert, event, trigger, you know, this is something. So so there are ways of automating and uh, the people friend, technology friend and all that. But I would, my advice is start with some basic framework, have some notes in place to identify the metrics. It could be a simple Excel sheet or could be some, advanced formula, whatever it is. But whiteboarding is something that someone has to start to understand where you stand. Yeah. Thank so you. I just wanted to add something very interesting from my consulting experience. You know, the basic thing that somebody needs to have, if you want to start an automation or any journey, is to have a clarity of thought. What is it that you exactly want? I have had an experience of seeing RFPs and responding to RFPs running into 200, 300 pages. I, I cannot divulge the name, but I've seen an RFP which summarizes as, I don't know what I want, but I want it now. So my, my consulting answer to that, and I got shortlisted also along with the best of the best consultants and uh, consulting names. So uh, my answer to them was, I don't know what I'm giving it to you, but I'll give it to you now. So the problem is they don't know what they want. End of the day, if you don't know what is the consultant or an automation not going to solve the problem. It could be an automated problem. It could be a very simple uh, uh, manual. So whiteboarding and you know getting your thoughts right, organized, be very clear what you want. First is your requirement, not for the heck of it. No, no correct, correct. I think I think I think it makes a huge sense to have a very clear thought process. And, and getting what exactly uh, you want. Uh, so we'll get into the next uh, stage. So we have collected the 
myths, the, taking the very first myth, and I'll, I'll go with Shrikan first. So Shrikan, you want to talk about the skills. I mean, particularly, you know, two questions which 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 really came up very clearly here. You know, uh, does automation need extremely special skills? And in case if it needs, how do you create uh, those skills or how do you motivate people to acquire those skills? So uh, can you can you get into this myth and let's take the myth head on. So Shikan, what do you think? How, how do we get the skills for automation? I would say it's a general transition happens uh, when you're trying to solve a problem. And um, so when you bring group of people you know, it could be an SMEs or business analyst or technology, the process people, and everyone into a whiteboarding to understand that, you know, what we're trying to solve. And especially once we identify what we're trying to achieve, now it comes to the technology. So in technology, I would say we don't additionally need a skill set um, to automate or hyper automate. It happens with the general transitions, you know, where it's end of the day, the human brains has to put their minds as such, you know, what exactly we're trying to do, what technology choices available. Yes, I do understand that low code, no code, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, advanced computing, yes, brilliantly there. So you need to be smart enough to understand uh, according to your business problem, what technology of choice you want to apply. So once you take uh, a particular technology of choice, then you need to further, you know, do a deep analysis, you know, any smart technology is available to take this to the next level. If not, then you need to automate at the process level. If not, you need to automate the people level. So end of the day, it's not all about technology trying to uh, hyper automate everything. So it's a collision of everyone to come together and trying to simplify the process. So it could be, as I said, the problem could be the IT or could be business. If it is IT, most of your projects, you know, uh, fall into improving your TAT, SLAs, uh, you know, how to improvise a KRS. It would be cloud or could be non-cloud or could be any product innovations. All, all that could be IT projects. When it's business projects, it's all about end of the day meeting the business requirement. You know, it could be inventing new products or new inventions or uh, helping them to uh, uh, simplify the workflows or... Uh, help them for business numbers and all that. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, they, there is no skill set separately available in the market to learn the courses, understand how to hyper automate. That could be a wrong approach, I would say. So, so anyone has basic knowledge of uh, having a decent experience who is in the IT industry doing some kind of project work, you know, can really hyper automate selecting the choice of technology, what is available. And then, so that is, I would say, you know, so, so let's not misguided that someone has to go to a course, hyper automate and, you know, do an advanced course. You no know, basic stuff, you do the courses to understand, but there's nothing you invest your money to advance yourself in learning automations, you know, hyper automations. Yeah. Thank you, Shikan. I think, I think it, uh, it really clarifies that it's not about skill set in the first place. It's really about the mindset and the way you look at the hyper automation. Now, moving on to the next myth, uh, uh, and uh, we would like to get details about it and the thoughts. So job losses, Mamta, it's it's one of the scariest uh, myths about the hyper automation. How would you like to look at it uh, and your, your thoughts about it, the overall threat of job losses? And I, I totally, you know, would uh, resonate with what Shikant was saying, right? It's not about uh, skills. And hence, you should not feel that you will become redundant. Anyone, you know, who who is working in the technology uh, side or maybe in operations as well. For example, uh, you know, in, in various banks right now also, uh, the, you know, the application forms get read by people who are, you know, totally uh, in, a, in a manual way. The form gets, you know, the information, the forms get fed in the systems in a manual way, etc. But then there are, you know, uh, automated systems like OCR, which can just read your PDF, you know, extract the information from there and feed it in your, you know, uh, systems. That does that mean that the people who were doing operational work, will they get totally, you know, wiped out? No, they will now have to learn how to consume this information, which gets, you know, created from the OCR systems. See, you cannot all, ever automate 100%. There will always be this need of human eye to anything. 
that's where when we are doing document ai at american express we also promise that we will be able to help you we, we are promising the operations team that we will be able to help you with 80 to 90 percent of the automation but 10 percent of that keen eye to detail will still remain with with your folks right that's how i feel that you can scale right uh, if 10 people were doing some work now it's only two people who would need to do that fine tuning that the remaining eight people can be used to expand you know your your markets can be used to expand some other pieces of business that you want to you know bring on can be actually retrained to do something else right and that's how they will have a bigger kitty of skills in their own profiles that they can you know talk about they can feel proud about etc Apart from that, I guess it is very, very important for the leaders to really, when they are starting on this automation journey, to really bring their team onto the, the, you know, the entire mission of going into automation. I remember one of the examples from my previous organization. I had this big project which was running for last five, seven years. And, you know, all of a sudden the client wanted us to, you know, go to a newer technology in the cloud. I mean, we were already using cloud, but they wanted us to use some of the new, you know, tech stack within the cloud. So, you know, we had this whole, you know, uh, thought about if we do that, will the project stay with the Accenture or not? Will they take the product, uh, project, uh, you know, internally in their organization, etc. But first and foremost, we sat with the entire team. I had a team of some 40, 50 people who were working on this project. We all sat together, we discussed, you know, what are the things that we need to focus on? What are the skills that we need to, uh, you know, bring on to the, the team, whether we, you know, bring them from outside or it is easy to really develop, redevelop the skills among, you know, the, the existing team members. And what we felt was it was much easier once the team is onboarded and they buy into the idea that they need to acquire these skills. It was much more cost effective as well as business sustainable to upskill my own team than to bring someone from outside because making someone learn the culture making someone learn the business nuances is much more difficult than making someone learn the technology so i feel it's all about you know the right attitude that people need to bring to the table to be able to learn the new technology and the right mindset of the leaders that just you know would do away with any kind of a fear that we may have in terms of job losses Thank you, Mamta. It makes That's a huge sense. Sorry, 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 sorry yeah. for interrupting. Just on the learning part, just wanted a small note. The, the challenge, as I have seen in my all these 30 years of experience, is not learning. It is actually the unlearning the past and learning the new things. You exactly. can't sit in the past uh, and ride on to the future without getting off the saddle. But people never do it. They don't forget. For example, if you're used to driving on the right hand side in India, you land up in US, then your left hand will be automatically searching for the gear. But the gear is on the right side. The problem is not learning. The problem is you have to forget that the gear is not on the left side, it's on the right side. Exactly. So it's, learning is a critical aspect of learning. And then one more thing, which I just remembered, uh, Vedi, since you started talking, you in, in, in the beginning, you spoke about, you know, UPI coming in and then cash becoming redundant and all of that. One of the, uh, you know, backside of this, what I've been hearing in some of the, you know, WhatsApp university chats is toffee business has suffered a lot because of this UPI yeah. payment, right? Yes. yes. So, I mean, of course, toffee business may feel that, oh my God, we are becoming redundant and things like that. But at the same time, you know, we are also, uh, you, this is also helping us in uh, reducing the diabetes of people, right? So there's always a plus and a minus. It's always which side do we want to look at? It's perfectly yeah. very well said. I think it's a very balanced aspect. So continuing with uh, Vedanathan, you know, uh, with job loss is the same question. And I know you're going to, uh, with, with learning and unlearning aspect coming from you, you're going to use the antidote here. But I would say uh, uh, the job losses, in fact, we should be worried about getting more jobs, right? I mean, what's your take? Is, is the hyper automation, it will automate few things, it will create new, new jobs in new sectors. So your take about the job losses, Vedanathan? See, it will not uh, be creating job losses. The thing is, to, again, you have to learn to do things in a new way. So it, you can't, like I said, you know, keep doing it the old way. I mean, you have to forget what you've done in the old way. Maybe doing it, you know, gone are the days when you had this phone, when you have to, you know, to dial one number, it'll take you one and a half minutes to ring the dial, you know, go in circles and again and again. Today, you can say, Siri, please dial my wife. I will dial. Simple. So you have to 
unlearn and learn. I mean, that, that's the, you know, one of the things, you know, like, for example, we did, you know, we went through this uh, CBS implementation, which has created a, a big uh, halabla in the market where, you know, people take 18 months to uh, do a CBS. It takes uh, almost three, four months to sign an agreement. But, you know, from start to finish, we pulled off the rug in 88 days flat. And still people are coming to terms with that. How did we do that? You know, it is basically, you know, in my first point is clarity of thought, what you want to achieve, you know, what you want to do. And be, I mean, doing something thus far, no further, not accommodating anything and everything under the sun or automating everything or not automating something which is needs to be automated. So, you know, that that's the point. I mean, it is not job losses. It's, it, it will create actually more avenues. So basically, you have to forget what you've been doing. Now, if you say a programmer wants to do COBOL, COBOL doesn't exist, Fortran doesn't exist, Pascal doesn't exist. So you have to learn something new. So technology, every six months, it changes. So you have to reskill yourself. So whether it is technology or otherwise, I mean, reskilling is an inherent part. I mean, that is not going to change. Very well said. So we'll take one question here. Uh, so again, uh, comes from Manish. Uh, from healthcare, uh, it's a very practical aspect here. You know, the best experienced age doctors prefer writing prescriptions over typing on a device. Any suggestion for taking automation forward in the healthcare? So this has to be answered in two parts. You know, so Deepak, I'll let you answer this two parts. How would you make a very experienced doctor use a technology to do the write the prescriptions? And in general, in healthcare, what kind of automation use cases would be there? Deepak, you want to take a, a look at it? Yeah, <clears throat> I can do that. So, you know, I think it is, you know, I think we are all talking about change management and unlearning, right? I think it is really that. But I think there are enough and more, you know, avenues for you know in healthcare, right, to become digital. So, I mean, one of the, you know, the, you know, the flavor of the season, if you may, is chat GPT, right? I think if you look at, you know, using chat GPT, for example, along with a, you know, a, a typical app, you can actually have not only prescriptions, but, you know, go to the next level in terms of what, what each uh, prescription entails in terms of the, the ingredients of that, you know, uh, the, the, the tablet or the syrup or whatever else. So I think there's a whole element of, you know, augmenting the, the knowledge uh, of the the healthcare, not the knowledge, but essentially having the knowledge at the fingertips of the medical professional to drive a lot of the decision making and the patient and and provider interaction, right? So so again, with you know within Evolute, we've done a lot of work in healthcare, right? So you know if you look at things like you know critical care management, right? How do you use, for example, event streaming? So data coming from let's say medical devices uh, and even you know, preventive healthcare, right? So data coming from your Fitbits and your Apple Watches, how do you process that real time combined with machine learning and drive, you know, we, we spoke about customer delight, but in this case, patient delight, right? So how do you create that that end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, workflow and customer and, and patient journey? Uh, but, you know, the short answer is, yeah, I mean, there is technology available. I think it, it's a combination of leveraging that and the, the change management and enabling the right tools, right, with the, with the professionals. Um, in terms of the second point, uh, Rajendra, around the use cases, uh, again, you know, I, I mentioned a few, but you know, healthcare is actually at the cutting edge of change. I think, think you know, uh, we spoke about banking. So banking actually has been leading so far, but I think just given a lot of constraints around, you know, whether it's cost, whether it is just you know availability of talent, I think the the infusion of automation in healthcare, right, is is going to be huge, right? So. You know, it's critical care management I spoke about and, you know, leveraging that. Uh, the other aspects is around, you know, even, you know, the, the medical professionals using, you know, by the month that you said OCR, so IDP, you know, in, in few, you know, infusing a lot of those and then using NLP, et cetera, to, to create almost like a like an assistant, if you may, for the medical professional. Uh, that That's another key aspect. And the last aspect is around streamlining the whole, you know, insurance provider, the, the medical provider, and patient interaction, right? The triaging of that to make your claims processing, et cetera, a lot more quicker, faster, and, and cheaper, right? For everybody involved. Uh, so those are, you know, three, four use cases that, you know, we have done, right, in, in healthcare that I think uh, come to mind uh, in really taking it to the next step. Thank you, Deepak. So, so, so far we have seen how difficult it is, uh, what, uh, how difficult it is to get the skills, how easy it is to, rebuild the skills, what kind of mindset do you need, 
then we also saw it is actually not a job loss so moving on to the next myth deepak uh, uh, the affordability i mean for an example hyper automation can it be done across the wide spectrum of industries which can afford a very basic technology right till the high end technology the high end technology guys can probably afford it so in terms of expensive or in terms of the need to create a separate parallel it system nowadays that that sometimes we think so how affordable how how can we make it easy uh, it is uh, the hyper automation deepak so so you know our firm belief is hyper automation or you know in general automation should not be expensive right the reason i think it becomes expensive is on three or four counts right one is you know i mentioned in my introduction earlier of what hyper automation was my initial thoughts was what organizations end up doing is you know procuring five six different technologies right they get something for your process orchestration you have something for your data integration you have something for the front end rpa etc cetera, etc cetera. now what you have to do is you know you have to spend 3 4 5 6 months putting all this together there's a team that works on it from a technology lens and you know uh, creates those you know point to point interactions and and integrates all of that uh, the second is each of these requires a niche skill set right so whether it's a uh, you know in, in in you know on on data side for example you need a python programmer right and for the front end you need somebody who understands you know javascript and mean stack and all of the you know those aspects right then for your rpa you need somebody who understands rpa and, and workflow etc now if you're able to you know have an integrated platform that looks at it consistently and have the same skill set across all of these right and with low code no code you know overlaying our automation that's now possible right so so that's something that you know can actually significantly reduce the cost of implementation a have an integrated platform that has the end to end capabilities b the platform should be able to do you know 70 80% of the heavy lifting in a low code no code manner and only bring in the expert python developer etc when you need to right and i think back to what you know we spoken about reskilling that's where you know the the enterprise can actually get involved right so if you look at you know operations people or people who are business analysts and domain specialists and i think mamta you also spoke about citizen data scientists etc right so the concept of business technologists and citizen developers is proliferating in the enterprise so if you can then leverage existing roles in the organization equip with them take out the mundane aspect of what they're doing you can actually get them more involved and then you know scale your automation very quickly and do it in a way that you know is uh, is leveraging the the rest of the enterprise it's not expensive because you're not hiring you know new skill sets and then also takes away the whole uh, you know concept of shadow it because it is not right i mean you have the organization that understands the business the best involved in the automation uh, and also with the the right platform you can create the guardrails and the governance to make sure that you know you're not sort of doing things on the side so so it's really about abstracting away that the complexity of the technology while not compromising on the you know the software engineering principle so it's really about making it simple not having a shortcut right to the implementation right so if you do all of this i think you can actually implementation implement automation at scale and do it at significantly lower costs thank you deepak i think that that really uh, clarifies about the whole mindset of you know the it, the whole hyper automation being expensive so mamta you talked about a very interesting aspect while answering a question earlier about the roi and one of the aspects that you talked about you know it's not about pure play money it's about you 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 measure it in terms of the time that you can get to focus on new innovative and strategic aspects so in a way would you like to share with us quickly about the whole budget planning you know the the, the sunset of a particular aspect giving feeding it to the new uh, budgets which are required or the whole what do i call the budget circulation or the cost circulation or cost utilization circular uh, circulation the way it can happen uh, in, in terms of hyper automation a quick thought about that continuing to what deepak was saying uh, for sure so i mean like i said right i mean of course uh, you will look at all the cost cuts etc that it will bring to table because you have now unlocked a lot of uh, efficiencies right uh, but that happens over the period of time and you know one of the i think one of the biggest hindrance is when people think about digital transformation or hyper automation they always feel that you know some magic would happen as a result of it 
and then you know your you will have your triple fold revenues or you know uh, maybe one tenth of the cost and things like that and you know because it's a long process what happens is it also builds up a lot of frustration very fast when things don't unfold so quickly right and that's where i feel that like uh i think where they said you need to be very clear on to what what is it that you are aspiring for what is the objective that you are trying to solve with it right so any journey that you are thinking about think of that objective think of the the ultimately poa vision right where you want to arrive towards the end think of it how are you going to achieve it and then sequence it out thinking about the low hanging fruits first so that you are able to showcase you know some of the benefits that you are trying to unlock as a result of this automation journey and thus also feed in back the you know maybe the savings or the productivity increase into the investment that you are expecting your leaders to do so at, you know have a full view of what is it that it will take you to you know to, um, achieve the entire hyper automation landscape per se but when you're asking for budgetary requirements only ask for a small poc that you want to show which will help you achieve those results achieve the benefits out of that poc feed that back into it so that it becomes like a constant loop and the leadership also sees you really you know driving some benefits so it's all about you know how do you prioritize how do you really you know keep on measuring what gets and and i always see, say that you know what gets measured is what gets uh, delivered right so when you're 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 on your hyper automation path you have to ensure that whatever you promise to yourself or to your organization you have to keep measuring how soon you're achieving it how close you are to achievement and if there is some failure which is okay then you know it is a failure fast enough to do go, go for a course correction that's how you know i usually ask for the budget to my leadership in my organization and usually i've been able to so far get whatever i've been asking so yeah i i feel it works thank you thank you momta i think uh, so far we have collected a good amount of myths and we have busted good amount of myths so very quickly getting into now the myths are being busted uh, a very quick discussion about how do we implement this and to begin with shrikan one question to you uh is are there any prerequisites uh, just a quick fire list of you know any prerequisite or any readiness uh, uh assessment that needs to happen what are your thoughts about it uh, mm, i would say the key considerations uh, you need to take when you're building your hyper automation um, portfolio um you can call it as prerequisites or constraints or considerations uh, but i would say three or four i can talk about one is time to market uh, you know constraint or always have uh, be clear on your time to market strategy you know by introducing the automations hyper automation so you know, what uh, exactly your tax and slas will affect the entire uh, workflow you know sometimes it may give you instant edge sometimes it takes time um, where you see the results only after a certain period of time so time to market constraint is something that very important to keep your entire business uh, portfolio or you know, your management to keep them aware you know what could happen by introducing this hyper automation that is one two is the total cost of uh, ownership again you know your return on investments and cost of ownership uh, which again goes back to your overall budget what could be the capex opex for this hyper automations you know is something that uh, you know you need to uh, be uh, aware what you're trying to do third is the skill set so whether do you uh, also need to to your reality check whether it, uh, does the organization or does your uh, the, both the business side and also it side have a minimum skill requirement to absorb uh, the hyper automation or uh, any uh, special trainings are required so these uh, things you need to keep in mind and finally uh, vendor check uh, vendor maturity and vendor check uh, plays a very big role because sometimes you end up a uh, lot of your expertise on vendors and partners and which is uh, which plays a very very important role so so that where you spend time on your strategic work and you rely on technology or you know for, with vendors and partners so a kind of a uh, skill check or could be uh, their uh, experience check expertise check plays a very important role ensure that the vendor to whom uh, you're trying to onboard have a decent experience expertise or working this hyper automation so this could be the three or four constraints uh, 
factor uh, in your strategy. Thank you, thank you, Shikan. I think you summarized it very well. So now moving on from from the checklist or a prerequisite of uh, hyper automation to begin with, uh, Vedanathan, uh, we would like to understand: is there is there any critical path? Uh, involved in hyper automation or is there a sample workflow or is there a model that you think you would recommend to the uh, users uh, very very high level model of you know uh, or a critical path with the nothing one of the thing is which i always say uh, being a consultant a vendor a user a customer a 360 degree journey the critical path for anything, be it hyper automation, automation, or even a journey, is uh, eighty percent planning and twenty percent execution. So, uh, if if you plan your things correctly, absolutely, you, the the rest twenty percent is shooting the ducks. So, and that has been done like an army like procession. And and people have asked me why is it and how is it that this particular uh, uh, task of doing a CBS in eighty eight days was achieved? It was very simple. I mean, clarity of thought and objective. What you want to do. And surprisingly, by doing this, we moved from a monolithic architecture to a microservices based architecture. We saved half the money and we saved almost what? More than half the time. Uh, typically, they say, you know, a CBS is like doing an open heart surgery while running a race. And people are so scared that they don't even take a decision on it. And, you know, they keep mulling over it and have these. Uh, in Hindi, I would call them Ardh Ganeshwars who have half the knowledge and have full uh recommendations and and it's very so you, you need to have horses for courses you need to have the right people in the team and who can contribute and who are part of the same journey and you know you have to be very clear what you want I mean, once you have clarity and then you get it down and don't keep everything on the mind write it down put it on, on the whiteboard if you want it right in front of you to see what happens and then you know just go for it if you have and one of the things which i personally learned in this journey was if the leader has 1% doubt, the rest 99 will add that 99% doubt. So don't do that. So there is the, the same uh, the poem which says, the charge of the life brigade. Not to question why, but to do and die. That's it. Simple. Straightforward. Do it. And, and don't look back. I mean, once, I mean, there will be problems. There will be, I mean, you have to take it and then move on. But I think, I mean, you have to, and don't, you know, have herd mentality. Don't automate for the heck of it. Just because your neighbor has a Samsung refrigerator, don't buy a Samsung refrigerator. You may not need a 365 liter. I mean, you may be a single person, you may need a small refrigerator. Similarly, automation, just because somebody else is doing, don't do it. Do it because if you need it. See, what a simple example, there are some pitfalls of hyper automation also. A car is a classic example today. You know, I like the old way the dashboard was made and the switches were there in the cars. Today, the modern cars are all completely screens. But the pitfall to that is you take your eyes off the dashboard and look at the screen. You know, you're in for trouble. I mean, go to dash. But if you have switches which you can work like a blind man and you know the size of the switch, location of the switch, you don't have to take your eyes off the dashboard, you can switch. So sometimes, Living with what it is, a simplistic way of looking at things is much better than doing hyper automation for the heck of it. But at the same time, you can't avoid hyper automation. I mean, you have to get the best balance between them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Vedi, it was absolutely fantastic to understand those aspects. So uh, uh, very quickly, we uh, uh, we now have about 11 minutes. And uh, so Deepak, uh, you have done so many uh, hyper automation implementations. Uh, specifically, if you can just talk about the results, you know, we, we are in sales, we always sell the result. We don't sell how exactly uh, blah, 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 and all that stuff. But uh, you want to talk about the success stories and how, what is the kind of impact it has done the hyper automation uh, in, in terms of results? Sure, sure, Ajinder. So I think, you know, so the, the EIQ platform has been used to implement use cases across industries and domains, right? So we've got, uh, you know, implementations from banking, insurance, and healthcare to manufacturing and retail. From a domain perspective, you know, we've, we've cut across, uh, you know, customer experience, like I said, earlier, in the use cases to, you know, the back office, in, you know, automation, et cetera. And I think typically when we when we look at you know defining the key success factors up front, they are they are typically sort of at two levels, right? At the at the one level is what you would you know call as more operational KPI. So things like you know we spoke about productivity improvement. So you know for example reduction of that 
you know, by 60% as an example, or cost reduction. If you look at a typical process, you know, one of the key metrics that get measured is average handling time, right? So if you have a, you know, let's say somebody calling a call center, what's the average handling time? And then the key metrics for that could be to reduction of that, you know, from let's say, you know, because every second is important from let's say, you know, two minutes to, you know, uh, whatever, one minute, right? That could be a key metric that you want to, and we've, we've, we've delivered that kind of impact from a end-to-end -end perspective. And then if you look at customer service, for example, we typically measure that from a NPS score. So we drive, you know, clear uh, path, you know, flight path to reducing and rather improving the NPS score. The other, the second level, right, that which we look at is really around the key business metrics. So we've, for example, you know, in insurance, one of the engagements we worked on was really focused around working with underwriters for faster cash realization, right? And and we were able to drive 50 to 60 percent reduction in in you know the realization you know lag, if you may. Right. Similarly, one of the use cases in banking was around you know loan uh, or you know using ML to actually drive faster loan disbursements. So there it was really around improvement in wallet size by 60 percent, right? As an example. Similarly, healthcare, it is really around metrics related to the, the patient, et cetera. So, you know, for example, reduction in, you know, payment uh, uh, timelines, you know, reduction in denials rate by 60% or 40%, whatever, right? So it's really around those business metrics uh, that we, you know, we typically focus on. So those are the kind of use cases uh, and, uh, Rajinder, the, the, you know, the, the metrics that we look at and the kind of impact we look at creating through hyper automation. Thank you, Deepak. So uh, we'll move on to the last section of our uh, discussion. We'll obviously wait for the questions. We have about approximately eight minutes. But as a key takeaway, uh, so starting with Srikant, as a, as a key takeaway, uh, what would you like to talk about as a key takeaway or a message to the, uh, to the audience, those who want to try the hyper automation? One, uh, you know, Additionally, you know, to talk about um, the success of this hyper automation, one advice I can say is, uh, you know, in, try to introduce uh, as much tooling as possible to, uh, you know, measure the entire journey of your hyper automations, you know. So your hyper automation portfolio, your technology portfolio has to be in a way that, you know, it can be tracked at every level. It could be in a task automation or could be process automation, it could be any business operations. You well, you introduce your digital operations, you know, digital sec operations. There's so many uh, jargons now these days, you know, it, uh, which um, changes uh, the way you code, you develop, you design, you test, and you deploy. So in this entire journey, where you know, introduce as much hyper automation as you can, but start measuring that in form of a tool. So that also adds an additional layer of, uh, you know, kind of a mature process uh, to make sure that, you know, it is tracked end of the day, and uh, which is very important for IT uh, heads, you know, always to be questioned by finance committees or the management, you know, the kind of investments, what we are trying to make. Um, at the end of the day, you need to give perfect ROI or uh, your uh, kind of spent uh, details. So, so introducing as much tool, you know, tooling as possible at like event processing or could be anything, you know, um, that will uh, really uh, make life easy, uh, you know, at, 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 to, to all the people across who are trying to do the hyper automation. Yeah. Thanks, Srikant. Well said. I think tool is aspect uh, is, is very important. Vedanathan, we definitely need one line philosophical quote from you for hyper automation. What would that be? Uh, okay, I'm writing it actually. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I were to say it, uh, okay. choose carefully, plan properly, execute ruthlessly. Oh, Basically, wow. hospital courses. Simple. Can you repeat it for everybody's sake? Or maybe just put it on the post as yeah, well. Yeah, I would say choose carefully, plan properly, and execute. You did ruthlessly. Basically, you have horses for courses, no friends and foes. The mission is more important than the people involved in it. Absolutely. I think this is a brilliant thought. Uh, so, so we'll definitely make it a point to uh, you know practice this. So uh moving on to Mamta. Mamta, we need one encouragement thought from you, or encouragement quote from you for all the users. 
not as fancy as uh, what Vedi gave. Very, uh, I think that was ve very, very impressive. But I would say that, you know, kill your procrastination. That's like, you know, the, the most, one of the biggest roadblocks. I think only two roadblocks that I see in the, you know, in the path of hyper automation is one, you need to get started, right? Once you have decided that this is the objective and just like how Vedi said, right? Choose carefully. You know what are you going to do. Do a good planning. But once that planning is done, just start on the journey. Don't keep on procrastinating. And second thing is, Please it is. Here. Sorry, I am tempted to say something. Please get out of this indecisiveness phase. Exactly. That's all. <laughs> exactly right. And also, you know, another thing which becomes a big, big roadblock is when you have not onboarded your stakeholders on the vision in the beginning itself, right? It is important for you, whosoever you're going to, you know, make things happen, whichever business unit that you're uh, supporting, whosoever is the stakeholders, it is extremely important to let them understand the vision that you're bringing to the table, to let them see the benefits that are going to come out of it. And if you're able to convince them in the beginning itself, you will see how smooth this journey would be. I mean, it will just become like a, you know, a win-win situation for all of you. And being technology, you know, partners, being the people who actually do the, the automation, I feel one of the, you know, very, uh, the, the, the trick that I use for, you know, making these things successful is also don't keep all the credit to yourself. You know, when your businesses are joining hands with you to really make things happen, you have to make them the forefront. They know that you are bringing in value, but it is them who are going to see the benefits and make them your custodians for, uh, you know, uh, going and talking about the benefits that are coming out. Thank you so much uh, for the benefits administration. And I think that really encourages in in a lot way. Uh, last but not the least, uh, Deepak, look, I mean, though we are not selling the toasters here as a guarantee uh, that we can give, but can the uh, the audience take that, you know, the hyper automation can work guaranteedly, provided we do it correctly, right? As 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 Vaithi said, as Srikant said, as Mamta said. So any thoughts on the sure shot guarantee of hyper automation quick one look it works right i think you know you know like we all discussed today i think that the trick is to sort of getting getting it right having you know the method to the madness and using the right tooling and the change management right at the end of the day it is not you know it is not a project right so as long as we you know don't treat it like a project it will work if we manage the change if we have that you know a top down and bottom up Right, have the senior management involved, the business ops technology involved, right? If they all come together to drive this, I think you know it works and it can really enhance the business agility and you know adaptability to to the you know the, the ongoing business needs and changes that we see in the organization. Right. Thank, Thank you so much, Deepak. I think with that we come to an end. But a quick fire summary. I think we have gone through the uh, the difference between automation and hyper automation, the myths, be it. Uh, uh, the skills or the job losses or the expensive investments or the uh, the overall difficulties and and many other aspects and how do we really go about it with the, with a prerequisite with a hand hand picked metrics with uh, with as as Vaiti said you know some of the aspects and as Mamta also talked about it uh, in reality I mean one quote really that comes to my mind uh, as a closure of this session you know. Uh, the software is the language of automation. We have been using the software for like so many decades, but in reality, that's the that's the beginning of the whole automation. We probably didn't realize this, and this quote came from uh, you know Edson Huang. Uh, with that note, I want to thank personally everyone, and I'll uh, I'll hand it over to Nitin to do the further uh, thank you note. But for me, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much to the participants and thank you very much to everyone here. Uh, it was my pleasure to host this. Nathan, would you like to do the uh, closing formalities? Sure, Ajendra. Thank you. You know, uh, just to let you guys know, you know, I have been doing lots of events from last many years, but this one will come to the top of my list. I'll tell you frankly, the way you guys made it, you know, it was lovely. And the uh, way the hyper automation is seen, you know, to do in, in a simple way, and the quotes by Vadi, you know, Mamta, Deepak, Srikanth, you know, it sets up 
whatever we had to do. So I think thanks a lot, all of you guys, you know, to come together and make this a good success. Just to wrap up, we would like to thank all our community partners, all the speakers and attendees who come, came together for enriching knowledge through this forum. We had a great set of panel speakers, as we all know, who came together to share thoughts. Just for your information, today's event was broadcasted in the YouTube page of our company. So all of you can go and see the recording anytime. Please log on to our website and like the social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, details, announcement of next events, and much more, which will help you register and attend the quality events. Also, we would like to thank InfoVision, which is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, which is our technology partner. To understand more in depth, connect with them. All of you can go through their website, which is infovision.com, and closely liaison with them. There are lots more in store for this year with focus on banking, finance, insurance, telecom, retail, healthcare, supply chain, manufacturing, energy, utility, and so on. So request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. Thanks and do take good care of yourself. Have a lovely day and great day ahead, all of you guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.